So it, it's a great honor to be able to moderate this esteemed panel of two. And we have an opportunity to explore science, spirituality, the mind, the body, with two people who are at the cutting edge of this work and who have d dedicated their lives to understanding these, this very important subject matter better. So I will do my best to just lead them into topics of conversation that can be the most useful to all of us. So I want to begin with the personal. I have now known Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati Ji for about, I think, six or seven years. And that relationship is a very important relationship to me. And when relationships are important to me, I, I do a little digging, and I do a little looking, and I do a little research. And I have done that. And I'm not sure if any of you know that Sadvi um, comes from a background of sincere, dedicated study in academia. I had the pleasure of reading her dissertation, which she wrote uh, about Parmarth Nikitan and what happens here, uh, an extraordinary dissertation that she wrote as part of her PhD. And I've been privy to hearing her story, and so I know that while we look at Sadvi today and we see her as a beacon of spirituality, a, a woman who has immersed herself in seva, in spiritual study and spiritual practice, it's interesting that she also comes from this background in the West of academia, of science, of empirical reality as well. So I wanted to begin uh, with Sadvi and ask her a little bit if she would be willing to share some of that story in her own life of how she has bridged the world that she came from to where we find her now here on the banks of Maganga. Thanks for being with us to, to moderate this, this conversation. Before answering his question, I also did just want to mention that we will be opening it up to questions from the audience as well. This is not so much a panel discussion as lectures, but rather really a conversation on science and spirituality, and we'll see where it takes us. We're happy for it to take us wherever it takes us. And you're all part of that journey. You're not just voyeurs of the journey. You're not just watching us take a journey, but you're part of the journey. And so we will open it up for sure for questions from people here as well. In terms of, for me on a personal level, that bridge, it's interesting because when I studied science, and studied academia and studied all of that which in the West is what we're told is a good education. I thought I knew it all. I mean, I thought I was learning it all. Science has this incredible way of weaving a web around itself so that it seems to be all of existence. And so when you study science, it seems as though you're studying everything. And it wasn't for me until I came to India, came traveling with a backpack. I had no idea I was going to stay. I was not on a spiritual path. I wish I were. I would love to say I was, but I wasn't. I didn't know there was a spiritual path to be on because I was in this tightly woven web of Western culture, academia, goal-oriented life of success as it's given to us in that Western definition of the equation for happiness, for joy, for fulfillment, which is a good education, a lot of money, 
a house in the right area of town, looking the right way in the right brand of clothes, et cetera, et cetera. We all know this equation that's given to us. So I wasn't looking for anything. Came to the banks of Ganga, and this is, as a slight but important aside, this is the power of grace. When you get something you've worked really, really, really hard for, on one level you could say, well, yeah, you deserve it. I mean, you've worked. But when you get something that you haven't worked for, when you get something that on no objective level that we're used to using to measure, do you deserve at all? That's grace. So if there's an exam in school, for example, and you study really, 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 really hard, and you do well, well, you deserved it, you studied. But if at the time of the exam prior to it, your, your mother or your grandmother or your child or a friend was sick, and so you couldn't study because you spent all your time taking care of the loved one, and then you went into the exam and you still did well, that's grace. And so for me, it was an experience of grace. I was given, given an experience, given an awakening, given a knowing, given a, all of that, a state, a place, a being of divinity. And what it made me realize once I got out of the intoxication of it and was actually able to look at anything. When I look at science now, because I still love it, but what I'm now very clear on is science has jurisdiction over things that science knows how to measure. So if it goes in a beaker, if it's got a weight or a volume or an area, if it can be heated up in a crucible on a Bunsen burner, if it can be seen through a telescope or a microscope, science knows what to do with it. And in that arena, science is really great. But if it's anything beyond that arena, science has no idea what to do with it. And because science has no idea what to do with it, it likes to tell us that it doesn't exist. So there's a little bit of ego in the web that it weaves. And this is what I love so much about sitting with my beloved Bruce because it's this, for me even just being here, is it's this beautiful dissolving of a web. We're not dissolving science, science is here. But dissolving this thick web that says science is everything. And actually being able to see beyond that aspect. And the only last point that I would mention quickly is we speak a lot in spirituality about truth. And so, for example, satsang is one of my favorite times of the day. It's something that I, I do each evening after the arati. And it's in the presence of truth. But as we always explain, it's not the truth that's relative. So it's not the truth of today is March 6th, we're in Rishikesh, because that's, that's only true right here, right now. It's not true for anyone anywhere else in the world right now. It's not going to be true for even us tomorrow. It'll be March 7th. It's not true once you're no longer in Rishikesh. And the truth of which we speak in satsang and in spirituality is this, this eternal truth, the unchanging truth. And science really likes to claim ownership of an unchanging truth, that what science says is capital T, truth. And the problem with that is that its truth is limited again to its tools. And so there was a time not too long ago where truth was 
that the earth was flat and the world revolved around it. And in your science class, you would have gotten an A for saying, yes, the earth is flat and yes, the sun and everything revolves around it. And then our tools got better. And then we were able to see, oh, wait, it's not round. I mean, it's not flat, it's actually round. Not because the truth had changed, but because our tools had improved. Oh, wait, we're revolving. And so for me, that, that intersection of science and spirituality really centers on truth because I feel that spirituality does have a hold on an eternal capital T truth, whereas science's truth is much more of a lowercase t truth, that it's, it's changing as our, as our tools change, as our tools improve, as the world changes, so does the truth. And that's fine. There's nothing bad with it. It's just not eternal the way that spiritual truth is. Thank you, Sadviji.